you're fake, people know you fake. Describing the behavior of the most sophisticated actors in the space, it was considered to be not worth your time. Do it because you love it. Any computer problem was to wipe and reinstall your stuff. Like I got to dive into the mindset. How beneficial this tool is, how impactful. To get access to all this mind share. That's the creative process, the process of trying. This is Hack Chat. My name is Marco Figaro, and today we have a guest. Usually I have a lot of friends that come on, and this guest is, is special. This is the first time we are going in depth and I wanted to keep it organic. Usually I have a list of questions and, I, and this is the first time I was like, nope, this is hallway con to me. And I'm super excited because this is the guy for me, if you're going into an industry and I was lucky enough to be in the industry in 2005, before it was an industry, it was more like a community. But I want to say if, if, I could compare it to if Bruno Mars was getting into the music industry, when he came in, he was looking at Justin Timberlake to be like, Hey, I want to be at that status. And these are the things that you have to do to get there. I'm super excited about this. Introduce yourself, the legend Pendrum. Marco, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm super flattered. Um, I don't know what kind of Justin Timberlake I am, but <laughs> thank you very much for that warm intro. I'm looking forward to, uh, chatting with you as well. Yeah, so my name is Pedro Mamini. You know, I've uh, been classically a, a reverse engineer, self-taught in the 90s, uh, and professionally was in uh, bone dev and, and exploitation for, you know, I'd say the first half of my career from uh, you know, throughout the, the 2000 and 2010 block. And then the past 10 years, I've been more of a, a startup guy. You know, I've, this is, a, I'm currently CTO at, at inquest.net. And previously, I was CTO at a, a company called uh, a Jump Shot that we had sold to Avast and got renamed or rebranded to, to Grindfinder. So this is not the same Jump Shot before anybody asks. That is the data sciences company um, that had some some uh, you know weird bad news around them. They had taken the the branding. But yeah, in a nutshell, that's that's who I am and how I got here. Yeah, for me, I think you said RE. How did you get into reverse engineering anyway? Because that's, sure. that's near and dear to my heart. And that's who I am. I love to reverse. And like I said, I think if we're looking at Justin and I was Bruno Mars, I feel like I'm at that point where I'm, I'm doing well because of looking of what you did and how you did it. So I want to know how did you get into it? Yeah. I, um, I've always, you know, from a young age, I've always been into puzzles. Um, you know, and at some point I had gotten my hands on a laptop in early years in, in high school. And I, as a matter of necessity, just to get access to, to software, um, I had picked up a copy of soft ice and I started, you know, cracking, uh, protection codes. And I, I found that that process actually of, of reverse engineering to crack those codes was more fun, uh, than any puzzles I'd ever done. And so really the, the debugger and the decompiler are the last puzzle I ever picked up. Mm. Yeah, I mean, well, how old were you when you picked that up? High school years, you know, what does that come out to be? You know, it's your, your teens, I forget exactly, but I figure uh, eighth or ninth grade is when I first started really getting into, um, you know, heavily in, into that world. You know, this is before there was any any websites like yeah. you know, RCE or, or, you know, any programs. Like now there are universities that like Purdue that offer um, – uh, a curriculum that will cover this kind of material. Uh, so at the time it was, you know, a lot of just tooling around, tinkering around. And then at some point I also found a, a 2600 magazine oh, yeah. and I started, you know, going to those, those meetups. Mm. You know, I lived in New York city, born and raised in New York. And yeah, at the time it was like a payphone bank off the 59th street stop yeah. of off the four five, six. And you would just get out there and, and meet folks and, and, you know, trade notes and talk. And that's how I got into it. Yeah, same, same. Picking up those 2600 magazines and looking and trying to understand. And it, back then it was it was like the only source. It was like you would wait every quarter for those and I'll be at yeah. Barnes and Nobles ready to pick it up. I mean, did that did that did you write anything for 2600? 
You know, I never have. I, I never have. I, I really, I really should at some point. Cause I, when I first got my hands on it, you know, that was one of the things I thought to myself is I would love to find myself in, in this magazine or, or in frack. And actually I've never uh, contributed content to either one of them. So once, once you started getting into it, um, when was your first opportunity in, in the industry? Yeah, so from from high school, um, and I went to a pretty competitive high school, and I, I had a, a bunch of AP credits that I could have skipped forward in college, but I had assumed that college would be more difficult, and so I didn't take any of those credits. When I found out how relatively easy the curriculum was, it, it left me with a lot of free time my freshman year, and also this was the first, you know, being in school at, at, at Tulane in New Orleans, it's the first time I really had my hands on a network that I could, like, scan and play with, and there was you know, hundreds of servers that I could tinker with and, and, and look around. And so during my time at, at Tulane, I spent a lot of my time just on the computer playing with this, this toy that I had access to. And numerous times I would, um, you know, get root on various servers that were core to the, uh, to the university. And I would report it to the, you know, officials who ran it and I would help them secure it. And, you know, kind of started building a reputation around campus as like the computer hacker. Well, you know, fast forward to my, my senior year, and over the course of this time, you know, I keep hearing about a prior, you know, you mentioned uh, your, your Bruno Mars to Justin mm-hmm. Timberlake. I kept hearing this name, Dave Endler, come up mm-hmm. as a guy who had graduated before I'd come in, and he was the previous, like, on-campus hacker. Uh, during this time, of course, I'm finding some, some bugs on my own. Uh, Blackboard was, was just released. It's pretty popular uh, curriculum management software now. Uh, but it was just released and, and they were using it at Tulane. I found a couple of different ways of, of uh, hacking into to Blackboard. And so I published those advisories on full disclosure and bug track, which were the, the two mediums for getting information out there at the time. And so this Dave Endler, uh, working for a company called iDefense, looking to launch the, the first, uh, they called it the Vulnerability Contributor Program, the first vulnerability buying program, at least publicly, what they did was they harvested these mailing lists looking for folks that were um, avid researchers trying to recruit them to join the program like you know mm-hmm. send us your vulnerabilities um, instead of you going straight to the mailing list mm-hmm. and this email that came to me because i was one of those harvested addresses came from none other than this dave endler so i thought it was quite a coincidence and you know i reached out to him and i said i am very interested in in this program uh, but who do you have on your side that's actually receiving these things. And he said, nobody, um, you know, we talked about uh, being Tulane alum and he happened to be coming to campus to visit some friends in a couple of weeks. And so the timing was perfect. We spoke and we hit it off and I ended up being the first hire to be the guy that received the vulnerabilities. From so the you were vetting all of the bones. Exactly. Yeah. And so from the, from the first one to, you know, we're talking about for years, I was working with hundreds of researchers looking at hundreds of, of zero day. You know, I really consider that somewhat of an unfair advantage. Like I got to dive into the mindset, you know, probably one of the first researchers to get access to all this mind share from so many other researchers globally. So I really got a, a quick feel for, you know, how to, to it's in art and a science. Yeah. I got a crash course in the art. Oof. That's, that is good because for me, like, I remember you were put out a, I think it was 2007 in Black Hat, you presented on fuzzing, right? That was kind of the year that I started getting into fuzzing. And then you put out a book. What, how did you get into fuzzing in general? Was it when you were vetting stuff and then you understood and you was like, okay, if I build, you know, some fuzzing tools, I could go ahead and find more bones. How did you get into fuzzing in, in, in general? Yeah, so so both at, at at the VCP under I Defense, and then later um, I had the privilege of starting the Zero Day Initiative uh, here in Austin, Texas, where I currently reside. In both cases, anytime we were vetting somebody's submission, we were having to set up the software, to set up the tooling. Mm-hmm. You know, you had to put in the effort to kind of scaffold up this project to validate it. So since we had gone through that effort, we would always decide to audit. Um, the target ourselves, you know, we, we've got it already set up. We, we've already done the work to start vetting it. We're starting to wrap our head around uh, how these people write code, how the components interact, what the attack surface looks like. Uh, and we know about a, at least one vulnerability that exists in this thing. So we would start to 
audit the thing on a whole. Um, and this also made sense for us from a financial perspective. You know, now that we've set this up, instead of buying the next 20 bugs from other folks, we'll find them ourselves and 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 you know, push them out and also build some street cred for the team. So when we did this, there was always two ways. And you could automate fuzzing and you could uh, manually just reverse engineering, walk through it all. And we would do a lot of this in parallel. So, you know, why not set up a fuzzer while you're doing your, your manual efforts? I, I took another leap in fuzzing when 3Com bought Tipping Point. They had put my team in charge of product security assessment internally. And we had purchased, um, at the time, one of the only commercial fuzzers available was from a company called Codenomicon. Mm -hmm. um, really neat data generation. But one thing that we found lacking was its ability to actually send the data and monitor so we ended up building a fuzzing framework around the data that we were purchasing from Codenomicon. And that really got me heavily into the mindset of, you know, how do we do this in a way that's um, scalable and automatable? Um, and it's around that time that I started getting into the creations of what became Sully um, and later what became, you know, our, our fuzzing book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, before you wrote Sully, it was really Spike, right? Spike was the... I mean, for me, on the outside looking in, Spike was like, oh, this whole thing. And then, like I said, in 2007, I remember that black hat. There were so many talks on fuzzing. There was around like five talks in, in, in just one day on, on fuzzing. But yours stuck out because of, of the title. I, I think it was like fuzzing sucks, something like that. <laughs> fuzzing sucks. Um, how yeah. do you enjoy it? Something like that. And I went there, right? It was so packed. I was sitting down in the front. Because it was so packed. And, you know, I think that same year, that Sully framework and the book came out. And that allowed me to jumpstart understanding, you know, things better. And that now there's more books out there. But to me, you've taken... It was... Fuzzing was popular. But then once you put out Sully, as well as uh, the website and um, that book, it just, to me, it, it took off. Where do you, I would, I want to say, where do you find the state of fuzzing today compared to 2007? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I mean, things are certainly, there's always improvement. Uh, probably the, the biggest change, I would say, uh, not from a tooling perspective, but more just from an industry, industry perspective is how much it's happening at scale. Uh, like consider a company, you know, obviously, Google, Project Zero, Chrome, you know, they're, they're beating up their own code base at a scale that most people will, would, would drool if they heard about it. But, you know, putting that behemoth aside, let's take a look at something like Mozilla uh, and Firefox, right? They, they fuzz very, very heavily. And it's part of their software development lifecycle such that if someone is coding and making contributions to the, um, you know, uh, to, to the repository, they'll kick off a fuzzer. So that while this code is fresh in the head of the developer, if they find a flaw, they can get that information to them so you can improve the security posture long before it ever even reaches, you know, the, the build that comes to you and I when we're downloading it, um, you know, from the website. And, and one of the things that really struck me is they had a person, a single person whose sole responsibility is actually doing the lowest common denominator from these fuzz cases. You know, imagine if you generate a test case that causes a seemingly exploitable crash and it's this long sequence, you know, what is the smallest version of that that would actually still trigger that, that vulnerability to give you a, a better idea of specifically where the issue, uh, where the issue is. So to me, that's the biggest change between then and now, right? Back then, it was mostly researchers applying this technique to find vulnerabilities. I think now, if you look at just the, the scale of it, probably there's more people doing fuzzing on the dev side as opposed to after the fact. And so it's made it more difficult. You know, if you're writing a fuzzer to try and find a vulnerability in the browser, you've got to be at least as good as the baseline of what, you know, these huge scale organizations are doing, or you have to find a novel way, some, some novel interface that people haven't looked at or some novel interchange that has yet to be, uh, you know, really heavily fuzzed. So like, for example, finding a bug in, in the DOM, uh, the document object model in the browser, I'm sure there's still bugs there, but fuzzers aren't really kicking that out very heavily. You know, more today, it's about just-in-time compiler um, targeting for, for the browser. That, that's what's really bearing the most, most fruit. So I think the maturity has increased, um, you know, more so than, than anything just in application. Yeah, 
I mean, as a CTO, you're looking at the whole picture. What would you recommend for companies that do not have number one, maybe that time, or they don't have that capability at, during that SDL process, what would you recommend for them to like get into that? Because some companies aren't even aware, I could name a few, but I don't want to throw them under the bus, but people aren't aware and are not doing that. So how, what would you recommend to them for them to start getting into yeah. like doing something like that? Yeah, there are, uh, I don't have any names to write off the top of my head on this, but there are services that you can connect to your repositories, right? And we're, we're seeing more of these automations too. Uh, for example, GitHub repositories that have automations when there's a security vulnerability that pops up in a library that you might build against, you'll get a notice that says, hey, you got to upgrade your, um, mm -hmm. your interface with this library because it's now got a vulnerability in it. There's also fuzzing almost as a service where when you make a commit, your continuous integration uh, process might kick off, you know, some fuzzing that will, you know, it's not going to be as good as a program like what Mozilla or Google are doing, but at least it's a step forward. You know, shy of that, perhaps the bug bounty is the way to go. And even that's been commoditized now. You don't have to manage your own bug bounty. You can use a hacker one or a bug crowd and just put up some, um, you know, some uh, investment in dollars to get eyes from security researchers onto your product, you know, before you really disseminate it out to, the general public. Now, when you moved over to Tipping Point, you started ZDI. I want to know, like, f nuts to bolts, because to me, you creating this, like, what did they pitch you to, like, f go ahead and, and run with it and start it up? Or did you pitch them on this is what we should do? This is the lane we should go? So... You know, prior to, I left iDefense when Verisign had acquired the company. In general, I'm not one that wants to work for a massive uh, firm like that. And previously- So you're a startup guy, anyway, right? You're a startup yeah, guy. Yeah, I like- Okay. Yeah, I, I like to work at companies that are up to, you know, maximum a couple hundred people. When okay. it gets bigger than that, it's time to, when people start losing sight of the mission and they're only looking at the cog that they're working on, mm -hmm. that's not an environment that I really want to, I want to be in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so previously, prior to the acquisition, Dave, who's a very close friend of mine, you know, we actually did three companies back to back together. It was iDefense, Tipping Point, and then we launched a, a Jump Shot together. It was a garage startup. The two of us put our entire, you know, life savings on the line, and and you know, literally just got together every day and and hacked that thing into into fruition. Um, but he was over at, at Tipping Point, and he reached out. And he was like, "Hey, we'd like to start this this kind of program." Um, you know, do you want to come down to Austin and, and do that? And I said, yeah, this is great timing. I'd love to. Uh, and one thing I really liked about the, the tipping point being a home for it is we didn't have to resell the information. You know, iDefense had an information feed. Mm -hmm. So we were playing this game where we would buy these vulnerabilities. Uh, we would record it to the vendor, but also tell our subscribers about it. Uh, and then later there would be a public disclosure. With tipping point, we could purchase the vulnerability inform the vendor, not tell anybody about how to exploit this thing, but put in defensive logic into our product, which is sitting in line and, and could block these these uh, zero days, or at least a subset of them. Obviously, you can't write IPS signatures for everything. And, and there was no disse dissemination of the information, right? It was, it was purely altruistic as far as I was concerned. It was a win-win across the board. You know, the vendors got something, we got something, um, and of course, the, the researchers got something out of it as well. How did... What, what did that look like? Once you stood it up, how many bugs were you buying per month or, or year? I mean, it was a lot faster to start the, the ZDI than it was um, the VCP. You know, at this point, uh, first of all, we had built a reputation for ourselves, you know, by name. You know, people knew, you know, I've been doing the VCP for five years and have a single complaint from any researcher about us not maintaining our end of the bargain. Um, and so, you know, reputation wise, I think people had built a trust you know, at, at the VCP, the first 25 submissions were laughable. I mean, we, but we would buy them anyway, just to, just to build that trust. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember buying a, a, a vulnerability in an abuse, you know, talking about a game, you know, Linux console game. Mm -hmm. And you know, the response rightfully so from the vendors was, you know, abuse should never be run in any kind of production environment. It's not designed <laughs> to be secured. You know, that's fine. We, we published that vendor response and we went through the motions 
uh, of doing what we said we were going to do in, in this workflow until finally we had received a bug in, in Apache. And from there, once people saw that in, in an advisory form, like they, the program just started building maturity. Mm-hmm. So the, the ZDI, you know, crept up pretty fast. Um, by the time, you know, I, I had launched it in 2005. In 2010, HP bought Tipping Point, and again, I, I parted ways. Um, in that five years, I want to say we were up to like you know, 5,000 um, uh, purchased uh, submissions. You know, to date, the ZDI is, is the biggest contributor of CVEs, the biggest contributor of, uh, of Microsoft bulletins. Um, you know, it continues to be a, a massive dynasty, much larger even than when I when I left it. Yeah, it's it's big. I mean, the way I look at it, Tipping Point was like the place in 2005, six, seven, it was you, HD, you had Dustin, you had so many cool people working there, researchers, putting out stuff, talks. How was it working in that environment? Oh, it's, I, I tell folks, my favorite time in my career was that time at Tipping Point. You know, not that I don't enjoy what I'm doing now, but there are different stresses. You know, the, the entirety of the company is uh, you know from sales to marketing to uh, personnel HR everything is is under my umbrella now you know during tipping point it was just pure research you know we we didn't have to really worry about uh, a budget or about any kind of marketing or, or or anything like that we just worried about about research and it was it was glorious I mean we we love what we did that the team was in, incredibly uh, uh, well tuned and, and well connected I mean even a couple of years after I had left uh, tipping point. The entirety of that ZDI team, uh, they got up and they founded their own company, you know, Exodus Intelligence, mm-hmm. based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, you know, one of the premier uh, offensive security shops, um, you know, in on the planet uh, to date. You know, that kind of, that was born out of that that environment. Mm-hmm. You know, just kind of echoing through um, uh, through time. So it was fantastic. It was amazing. I mean, I learned something every single day, and it was so exciting that. You know, we literally on a regular basis, Wednesday nights were our skip the night of sleep a night. We would get together and we would stay in the office. The, we'd pick one target and we'd stay in the office all night and we would collectively um, audit it. And every single week something fell. You know, there was not a, a week that we would put our collective uh, attention on something for, you know, call it 12, 15, 20 hours and not find, um, you know, some major zero day. I want I want to get back to that. You know, the way I look at it and I was telling HD this, you guys were the Google zero of today back in 2005, 2006, and, and maybe even bigger because there's so much things you guys were publishing and and sharing with the community, right? You just have right now Google, Google that team, all they do is post, but let's, let's go back to that Wednesday night. What does, how many people, give me, paint the picture for our citizens watching. What did that look like? Was it a war room? How many people, how did you, Pick the target and who went and did what. I want. I want to go yeah. back there. I want to relive that. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, there was five or six of us on any given um, uh, evening for this, and you know, in it like a typical office environment, uh, we had a row of cubicles. You know, mm-hmm. as as a, a director, I was offered an office, but I wanted to sit with the team, and so I was one of the the members in this row of cubicles. And the nice thing is that we could just, you know, spin around and talk to one another and then come back to our computer screens. And we would do that all the time. So, you know, we had, I've always been somewhat of a, a process hacker. Like if you ever look at me move on, on my system, um, everything is a keyboard stroke. Everything is two keyboard strokes away. Like I can orchestrate the entirety of all the apps that I use with, with just some, uh, some keystrokes. And we'll do that at, at a scale for the team as well. So this is pre Slack. You know, we use Skype mm-hmm. um, to maintain a, a Skype channel. We had a bot. Uh, that bot was written in Python, and we'd all hack on it, and it could do things like draw a short straw for who randomly had to do a task that nobody wanted to do, or to take notes, or to add some you know a, a to do uh, to the list of things that we wanted to to get done. And so it was very much uh, like what you would see in, in a modern kind of CTF with people collaborating and different people have different specialties and breaking off into into small groups. But it was literally a, a row of people, six people, you know, two columns of three. Um, and target choice, you know, sometimes we'd pick a, a complex software that someone had to set up that week uh, because of a submission that we got from, from the ZDI. 
Um, other times it was something that we wanted to do because it was just kind of fun. We had access to it in the office. You know, we had one of the first VoIP systems uh, that we, I had access to was in the office itself. I'm like, no, let's take a look at this thing one night, just see what kind of uh, uh, you know, fun hacking we can do on it. And really that's what it comes down to. It's, it's fun to it's do fun. this kind of hacking. Yeah, uh, I look forward to one day this kind of work no longer being my vocation, but my avocation again. Like I want to be a hobbyist. Yeah, yeah. How did you make the transition from doing all of that offense to, uh, I believe, the talk you did at Black Hat on on the malware stuff and and starting to focus on the defensive side? You know, when I when I switched from you know, I defense was a, a, a startup. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I was like the twenty something uh, employee there. The tipping point is very well established in the public traded company by the time I had joined, but maybe like 150, 200 people. You know, the, the next leap from there was Dave and I starting our own company. And when we sat down, obviously a natural choice to potentially make would be to do something continuing in the offensive, offensive realm. We knew that we wanted to work together. We didn't know exactly what we wanted to do. And so many ideas came up over the course of, of brainstorming. You know, one of the, the, the sub bullets you have to look at is it's not just what you can do or want to do, but you know, what are you most likely going to have success doing? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we didn't have a budget for, as an example, um, to go start like a bone buying program. Um, And so we, we picked uh, a topic that was, you know, personally, you know, beneficial. This concept of jump shot was, and really my father was the inspiration. Every time I went home for the holidays to New York, you know, there'd be some, odd infection on his windows pc that would require me to boot into linux and start looking at this thing forensically to try and figure out you know how is the operating system compromised is it the master boot record is it some root kit you know is it some system service that's been uh, infected and so the thought is if we can automate that in an easy fashion like you know plug in a usb stick and you get a screen with a cartoon character and you push a button and he turns off the pc and boots it up onto linux and it's all clean and nice you don't even ask the person for a Wi-Fi password. Like we went through the reversing hassle of pulling that from the Windows registry hive. Uh, so we wouldn't have to ask somebody for their, their Wi-Fi password when they rebooted. If you can automate all that and make it easy, then you've got something that can sell. And we decided, you know, we wanted to launch this product on Kickstarter. It took us two years to build the prototype that before we can actually go and, and put that project on Kickstarter. But that was our how we were going to, to market it. And that's how we were going to get it out to the initial group of users. Um, and it was great. You know, we got a lot of champions in that process, folks who were um, home PC repair or other tech guys who were in our similar shoes. You know, they're always helping friends and family, um, you know, clean exotic malware off their PCs. And so really that's that that whole vision. Um, it, it, we're lucky at work because otherwise it's been two years of <laughs> wasted R&D time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was the vision for how we we're going to get it out there. So it just made more sense defense wise, there's a lot more consumers of defensive product out there than there are of offensive products. When you put it on Kickstarter, what was the goal in terms of uh, the number you wanted to achieve the money? Did- Not exact- I want to say we put the goal and you know, now, at the time, we were one of the top 10 most funded tech projects. I think we had set the goal for for like 25,000. And because you know, again, the goal was to our goal mm-hmm. was to get the word out to seed the what we hope become a viral spread, mm-hmm. right? It was easy to gift these USB keys to people. Um, so our goal was to get this initial creation. I want to say we raised seventy five thousand, mm. um, you know, from from the project, and that was enough for us to make some some junior hires, right? It was the first time Dave and I had any kind of uh, help uh, in, in getting this thing out the door. Wow. How how long did it take you from? Once you got that money to, did you get any seed rounding or, or any funding after that? Or did you? No, we, we bootstrapped this thing. I mean, Oof. you know, we, we took, uh, you know, both of us collectively, everything that we had, obviously two years without a salary is, is a heavy hit for a, uh, you know, 25 year old, 27 year old. Absolutely. It's a, it's a lot, it's a lot of, a uh, lot of strain. Um, it certainly kept me up a lot at night. Um, <clears throat> But so we, you know, from there, we started growing, um, you know, the, the viral thing did work the, the, the way that we modeled the pricing, uh, folks would gift it and they liked it and they'd buy it and they'd gift it. So we grew organically to a couple of tens of thousands of users. 
and that was able to you know hire against it and keep growing organically. And then we got noticed um, there was a, a computer world reviewer, mm -hmm. you know, like one guy with a really cool um, setup in, in his house, uh, you know, and and his AV review, which at the time I didn't know about this. Um, I, I found out about it after the fact, after we got a, a good review from him and I saw the article, then we started getting interest from folks because the AV industry knew about this guy. Mm -hmm. And they, when they saw this great review of ours, they're like, who the hell are these guys that came out of nowhere? How are wow. they beating us wow. in, in the reviews? And of course, you know, we had an unfair advantage here. The whole premise is we're not going to deal with the runtime system. Mm -hmm. So every one of your, you know, runtime AV and EDR, it's dealing with the current running system and any infection that might've slipped through is, you know, going to put in question the, the, uh, the honesty of the information that you're getting mm -hmm. back from the operating system. So by rebooting into a Linux environment and just you know running on the metal, but then analyzing um, the OS on disk, looking at the master boot record, looking at um, you know everything, you know, every mm -hmm. partition record, every system file. Uh, we looked at the entire startup chain. We had enumerated like 200 locations you can like hook into the Windows boot. Right, this was like the heavy R and D part. The mm -hmm. two years that fed into prior to the launch, so we just had a huge unfair advantage. Like we're we're out of bands, and if I find something that's suspicious, I don't have to delete it. I can at least pull it out of the startup environment, and by doing that, maybe it's a false positive, and the user now has to launch an app on his own. But if it's not, I've just cut the head off of the infection. It's now laying dormant, and many times an AV would come up and clean it up after the fact because mm -hmm. we didn't get it. We kept it from booting up, kept it from uh, infiltrating the OS, and now they can just clean it up off of disk as they recognize it, you know, with one of their millions of signatures. Yeah. What What year was that when when that article was written? It was I want to say that was in 2012. You know, so that he was like the we virus watched. total before a virus total became big, I guess. He was. You know, he would probably pull samples from virus total. He was more of. He was really testing because keep in mind, virus total is just the static analysis yeah. engine. Yeah, and yeah. like something like jump shot would never be able to be in virus total because yeah. you know, we don't we're not looking at, at just the files, we're looking at like the entire context. So this guy was actually testing it as if you had the product installed. Like I am a user, I have an infection. What would happen if I ran malware? So he was setting, what would happen yeah. if I had a vast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that's that is interesting. And you sold jump shot, right? Yeah, actually, that article, uh, one of the attentions that it grabbed was uh, folks over at Avast. Oh, you know, they, they flew down and, and came and visit us in our tiny little box of an office here in, in Austin. Um, and, and it kicked off a conversation that resulted in the acquisition of, of the company. And you know, that was really exciting, too, because I got to then grow from, you know, tens of thousands in scale to millions in scale. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, all the cloud services that we had built at the time was on Amazon. You know, you had an engine that you built. And now we're just really revving it up and seeing how it will handle, uh, you know, bigger and bigger uh, orders of magnitude of scale. And that was a great learning experience as well. You know, once again, removing the, the thought process of how do you generate sales and instead replacing with just pure engineering challenge, mm -hmm. like as, as fast as you can take them, they're coming in. So that was quite neat, too. And it's I, I want to say I have so much respect for you putting it all on the line. I had an opportunity to do something like that, and I couldn't find myself the courage to pull the trigger because one, it, it wasn't like he was my like best friend or mentor or something like that. It was a guy that was like, oh, you know, we're going to do this. And I was like, man, it's interesting, but I, I, it's too much on the line for me. I, you know, I have bills and this and, you know, things are going on and I couldn't, I didn't want to do it, but like you bet on yourself, you bet on your partner and man, that that's an awesome story. And I think a lot of people will take away from that when they, when they hear, hear this, um, what are you doing now? What is your day to day? Yeah. So I've got, um, you know, I, I've got my, fingers in a couple of, of different things. I have a couple of technical advisory roles and uh, investor roles in companies like Attack IQ and uh, Gray Noise, uh, Exodus Intelligence. And I've always been a friend of the family there and I sit on their advisory board as well. Uh, that's, and I, so, you know, that's one of the things that keeps my sanity, right? I've, I've got a foot in the offensive space mm -hmm. still. I get to surround myself with, um, you know, that kind of, of thinking. 
know, those, those lateral thinkers are, are my favorite kinds of folks to to interact with. But predominantly, most of my day is spent on uh, my startup Inquest. You know, we we're born out of the DoD space. You know, I, let me tell you the origin story of it actually, yeah, because it's also you know, a, a fun story. And again, I'm working with a, a close friend, uh, which in many cases is a dangerous thing to do. But if you can pull it off, it's it's very fulfilling. Because, uh, you know, when you're taking meetings together and you know each other so well, you have like this unspoken. And Marco, you know what I'm talking yeah. about, you know, being from from New York. You can have an unspoken dialogue in like a look, mm -hmm. which allows you to just progress and move faster than you otherwise would if you didn't have that unfair advantage, that, yeah. that sixth sense. And you'll hear me say that a lot because I think if you're doing a startup, it's not just about the idea. I think you need to have one or more unfair advantages if you expect to be able to to make it. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there, a lot of competition, a lot of dollars. And without some um, you know, legs up, it, it, it's hard to find success. But so rewind to back you know, at tipping point. We've got a ton of zero day. Uh, you know, we can detect a subset of it with the IPS. And I, obviously it would be a, a, a story dream come true for us to have knowledge of the zero day that overlaps with some bad actors knowledge of the zero day. And so our defensive mechanism blocked a zero day malicious campaign from going on in the wild. And we knew empirically that there's a lot of overlap. We would get, you know, within a, the same quarter submissions in the same product, the same vulnerability, root cause vulnerability, but from two different researchers on two different sides of the planet who clearly approached the problem with two completely different perspectives. Right. And sometimes it'd be three or four people who had found the same vulnerability and reported it to us. And look, we didn't talk to every researcher on the planet. You know, we had a, a quite a decent statistical sampling in comparison to others. But if there was that much overlap in what we saw, then certainly it was heavy on the grand scheme of things. So one of our customers was the, the Pentagon. And the first inline device they ever deployed was the Tipping Point IPS. And so to get that approved, there was a lot of um, technical exchange meetings. And the guy who ran their team, the, the Pence Cert, Computer Incident Response Team, uh, Mike Arcamone, he's the founder of Inquest, uh, you know, and my, my biz close friend and, and business partner uh, now. And so their goal was secure pipe for the five wedges and whatever 60 regional locations that, that went through their, their sock. You know, they started off with buying, vetting, testing, tuning, best of breed across the spectrum of, of analysis tools. Uh, and then as the team continued to mature, I mean, he ran this team for 15 years, they started looking at open source tooling. Then they started looking at custom tool development. And so while we were chatting and we wanted to find more zero day, um, we started writing detection logic for other tools they had, some other commercial off the shelf vendors, some open source vendors, including this, this one homegrown solution, which eventually became known as, as Inquest. So the, the, the core technology was born, you know, out of the basement of, of the DOD uh, by, you know, built by SOC analysts for SOC analysts designed to, to monitor high throughput, you know, sensitive networks. Mm. You know, fast forward to today, and we've, we've expanded that technology to be more enticing to the enterprise uh, by making it available as a SaaS. You know, instead of mm. me giving you the tech, you just funnel your data through. And so we can provide security that way. Wow. How, how big are you guys now? So same story, you know, fully bootstrapped, no outside investment, organically grown, uh, found in 2013. Uh, you know, we're 25 folks now, a uh, decent contingency of them here in, in, in Austin, uh, although we're, we're mostly virtual and, and founded out of Arlington. And we're 24 out of 25 you mm -hmm. know, engineers and, and threat researchers. We have one sales guy. It's very, very engineering heavy company. How is it like... You know, you hear these, I, I want to say fake numbers on, on valuations and stuff like that, because there's so many, um, there's funding rounds, right? How is it to, to bootstrap? Is it, is it very difficult? Do you feel? Because this is your second time. And I think a lot of people hear about the funding, but there's not a lot of stories out there on, on bootstrapping and what it's like to bootstrap a company, you know, just it, it for me, I've I haven't heard many stories. I, I always hear of angel investors, and then you go to you know funding round A, B, C up to F, or whatever the case is. How is it? What 
what do you feel is, is some of those biggest challenges when you're bootstrapping? Yeah, you know, it's um, so part of what I've really spent a lot of my time studying in the past uh, few years, honestly, is a lot more on the sales and business side of things, like the concept of building funnels and having different offerings and pulling people in and, you know, outreach campaigns. You know, one of the and you're right, it is a rarity today. Uh, if if you know, if I'm honest, I, I wish this bootstrap company existed you know, 15 years ago. Because in this market, it's very hard to compete with the rampant amount of dollars that are that are out there. You know, how can we make our voice heard when there is a team of like 50 sales guys for for the nearest competitor that are saying whatever they're saying? Like, you know, mm -hmm. people one one thing you have to admire about the the public sector, while they are slower moving, they do their own research. Mm -hmm. They don't just follow what a Gartner says, which is driven by um, you know whatever uh, marketing tools. You know, they actually bring things in, they'll have a bake off and, and they'll choose what they consider to be the best solution for the specs that they wrote up. So we have a fair shake. I can compete against CrowdStrike if I'm going against them in the public sector. If I'm going against them in the enterprise sector, you know, it's a totally different animal. And I just pull CrowdStrike. You know, they're yeah. not a competitor to yeah. us. They're just a huge publicly traded vendor that I'll use as uh, as an example. So it's very difficult. You know, the what you're mentioning, right, there's there's a growth train. Um, like we're a profitable company. We have been since day one. Most of these companies, these massive valuations, and you look at someone like Uber even, they're losing their money all the way through the IPO and, and, and even beyond. You know, a lot of the promise is the valuations based off that promise, mm -hmm. that eventual reality that, um, you know, hopefully they'll build this self-driving fleet that suddenly will make the company vastly uh, profitable. And then all the investors can can benefit from it. So it's definitely a very different game. Um, and I'm not quite sure what I would recommend to, to most folks um, getting started. You know, one, one story I do like to tell, which I think is very indicative of what it takes to make it in, in the business realm is look at Angry Birds, the, um, you know, the worldwide known brand, mm -hmm. right? That was like their 40th release. They had dozens and dozens of failures beforehand before they finally hit one that that worked, right? If you if you study, um, you know, like papers from like Y Combinator, they look at what is it? All things being equal, what is the highest? What is the most important attribute that defines the success of a company? And it's timing, right? Which is basically saying it's luck. Mm -hmm. Like the same team with the same funding, if they come up in the wrong time, they may or may not have had that relative success. So if you're looking at it that way. And your and your goal is success. Your goal is not you know your your goal is maximum dollar, not I want to solve an interesting challenge. Then your best bet is to fail fast, mm -hmm. is to take money, go fast, bring a bunch of people in, fail fast, and then try it again and again until you hit something that has that you know astronomical hundred x uh, return. Yeah. It's a very very different way of going about it. Yeah, I mean, your your name carries a lot of weight in this industry. So I, I'm sure you could go to, you know, investor Ave over there and, and ask for whatever you want. And someone will write you a check because, you know, they understand the success you've had in the past. So it's very interesting that you're going that bootstrap route where a lot of other companies, they be like, well, I'm going to sign off to get this funding, but I'm going to lose control. Right. And, and yeah. that is always weighing like how much control do you want to lose and how many board seats do you want to lose compared to what you're doing where you're controlling everything? You know, it's it's amazing what you've done and what you've built. Where do you see Inquest in the future, the next five years? Yeah, you know, we um, we grew by word of mouth predominantly mm -hmm. um, and are you know, quite successful in, in the public sector. We have appliances all around the world. And our, our next you know, goal is to have similar success in the enterprise space. You know, similar to how Inquest started, we, we, did, we began with you know, gap analysis, right? The guys were, they, they bought everything and they saw what was still getting through and they, they built something that, that covered that gap. So we started looking at the same thing on the enterprise side. Um, what does the gap look like with, you know, we chose email security. Our solution is we want to protect users. We want to protect the transport to users. And what that means is you're looking at web and email traffic. And between the two, something like 95% of all attacks begin with an email, whether it's a malicious link, you know, some um, 
uh, malicious attachment, you know, whatever it is, if something as silly as like invoice scam, like whatever it is, it generally starts over email. So the first thing we did was, and you talk about that, that black hat talk from 2019, you know, which is predominantly in the history. I was very fine tuned and looking deep into one piece of malware, perhaps with that talk, I'm looking at things at scale. The idea is, can you look at a huge corpus and find the interesting things that stand out? Well, from that talk, we launched labs.inquest.net, which is like a kind of like a, an open research portal that's a, a, a viewport into this apparatus that we've built for finding novel, interesting malware from large corpuses. Well, we took that apparatus and we took the, the samples that we deemed were, were interesting. They're known malicious um, and they seem to have some evasive characteristic to them. And we literally pumped them through a bunch of accounts I created. You know, I made an enterprise account for 0365 with ATP, with phishing, Google Enterprise, with Amazon SES and the check mark for security controls. And so I literally take that funnel and I loop them through all these accounts I have and I see what makes it through. What makes it through is the gap. And that's the gap that we focus our efforts on because if I can close that gap, that's something I can sell to the enterprise. And so to show them that, you know, because now that I've built all this tooling, it was relatively simple for me to now add anybody's account. So if you've got, you know, an email address at Sentinel One, I can have you set up a forward rule and I will send you every day a couple dozen malware that I know bypass all the security stacks that I'm testing. And if it loops back to me, I know it bypassed you as well. And you'll get a daily report that shows here's the kind of malware that made it through. Um, and of course, the next step is, well, how do you block it? That's where we come in with our, our sales pitch at that point. Show mm -hmm. the person the problem and then come in with the solution. Wow. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Hopefully retired. <laughs> 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 nice. These, these bags under my eyes are, 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 are well earned. Uh, I, you know, I'm definitely, I hope to be back to a, a hobbyist. You know, my, my dream, my dream would be to have the liquidity that I could create a think tank that we could then spin products and companies out of. I, I love working with, that's why I have these advisory roles. I, I love working with um, with young startups. Um, I like I like technology. I, I, I really legitimately nerd out about all these things. I would read about it. I stay up late reading about these kinds of things. And so I'd love to uh, be in a place where I can help foster other people's growth and, and offer some mind share where I can. And, you know, have the freedom and flexibility to spend more time with, with my family and just return to doing InfoSec as a hobby. Nice. I always ask every guest the same thing. Take me through one of your days when you wake up, what time that is, what you do in the mornings until you go to sleep. What, what does that look like? That, that requires a very uh, heavy uh, routine, which I change it all the time. Right. My, I'm always playing with, with tooling. If I ever feel a little bit overwhelmed, uh, I'll take, typically take a step back, maybe even like uh, book a day off and just start looking at how I'm organizing information. Maybe I'll consider a whole new tool. Like one of my favorite tools today is, is an app called note plan. It's calendar driven tasks, right? So like when I open up this, this every single day, I have a new note and it, it basically starts off with, with three sections, new stuff that I need to do. Um, a log of stuff that I have done because what you want to do and what you end up doing is always two different things, at least for me, because things come up all the time. Um, and then finally, just notes that I've taken from that day. And so one of the nice things about this is I can see, you know, throughout the course of the week if, at, in a very easy view, what have I done? What do I need to do? And the instant I have some free time, I'll go look at that queue and, and go pick up and do something that will fit in the amount of free time that I, that I have. You know, most typically though, when I wake up, the first thing I'll do is is give my daughter breakfast um, to give you know mom a little bit of a, a break in the morning. We have a newborn, so that keeps her up at night. Um, and then once um, uh, that's done, I'll, I'll transition to to work. You know, these days because we just bought a house that we're also remodeling. That's on top of the myriad of things for me to do. You know, I'll ride my bike over there. I got a bunch of uh, boxes set up with a, a desk and, and Google Fiber, and I'll typically you know work out of there so I can receive goods or if I'm working with a contractor, kind of guide them along. Or, you know, if I've got an hour break here or there, you know, pick up a hammer or you know, do some plumbing or some electric, you know, on my own, you know, ride the bike back, you know, have dinner with the family and then transition back to, to night work. 
you know, the unfortunate reality is that the best time for me to get real work done is in the evening mm -hmm. uh, when things are a little bit quiet, mm -hmm. when I can take a three, four hour chunk to myself, because this, you know, real tech work can't get done in 20 minute increments. It takes some time to kind of load, you know, to kind of cash into your, your, your flesh cash, your, your brain, the data that you need to consume to put your mind around the problem that you want to work on. So, you know, it, I, I might hit a stride and the next thing I know, the sun is coming up um, because I've just been, you know, gotten lost in, in, in whatever I'm, I'm trying to, to hack at the time. Let's go into that, that when you, when you're hitting that line, is there something that you're doing? So for me, I, I have triggers, right? Um, I put on headphones, there's certain music I need sent. Uh, the lighting needs to be a certain way. So once I smell that and I put on this music, it's go time. It's telling my brain, hey, this is what's going on and it's going to happen. Is there something that that gets you in the mode or triggered? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that, I man. I, uh, I have different versions. You know, I, I've done a lot of, um, uh, I, I do a lot of, or historically I've, I've been athletic. Don't look at me today. I, I sit behind a chair a lot. Uh, but I've done a lot of combat sports. And so if you look around my house, I've got, things like, you know, punching bag, a Wing mm -hmm. Chun dummy, like a little jujitsu doll in the corner. So I've got three modes of work. You know, one is a music driven. One is, you know, like a well-known movie, something I've watched a million times, like Goodfellas or something like that in the background. And another one is um, having some exercise. So it's one of three modes that I will hit where like when something's compiling or building or running, you know, I will tune into whatever scene it is or a song it is, or I'll get up and, and do a round of, of whatever uh, training I'm doing. So there's definitely um, something you're doing at the same time that kind of uh, cohabitates or, 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 you know, like a, a, a co-agent. But uh, caffeine's a big portion of it. I drink a ton of, um, of yerba mate. And so, you know, for me, having that in the water out and sipping it and uh, diving into it is, is definitely a uh, a, a mental trigger, I'm sure too. Do you drink a lot of coffee, or is yeah. it? No, this is. Um, yeah, I, don't, I don't have to reach very far to get one of these things, but Urban this Mott. is my uh, caffeine of, of choice. It, it it has as much um, caffeine as a coffee, mm -hmm. but it doesn't give you that jittery feeling. Like I love a double espresso after a meal, but I'm not going to pound six double espressos over the course of a night. Um, that'll just give you like this, almost like a um, you know mentally you feel a little jittery. It's hard to, mm -hmm. to focus. Um, this tea has the same amount of caffeine, but it has a very clean, uh, up feeling to it. You know, it doesn't really distract you. You don't get the jitters. Oof. Well, listen, thank you for your time. Do you have any last words for the citizens out there tuning in? No, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the time Marco. It was, it was a pleasure. You mentioned you're moving to Austin. I really look forward to uh, having you here. Yeah. Member. Yeah. Boarded... I am planning to go to Austin and once I get my second shot, which is in two weeks, I'll be co-vaxxed. And then, you know, two weeks after, three weeks after, I'm going over there to take a look at, you know, where I want to uh, land. So I will be reaching out to you to have a coffee. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to to move to Austin. Oh, yeah, I look forward to having you. There's um, yeah, there's a lot of growth going on in Austin right now. Uh, already, this is just a great town. We've had super high density in, in hackers. I think we might even have more hackers now in Austin than they have in, in our Argentina and Buenos Aires, which has always felt like a very, uh, you know, around core impact. There was a very hacker dense uh, culture there. So I look forward to having you in town. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Until next time. Thank you all. Cheers. Take care.